Mr Crispin here once again and welcome to my workshop. Now sorry to tease you if you were here for Pistons and Rods Part 2 but I've got to grind around those tools from scratch and I thought I'd do it on camera. Now the experienced machinists among us aren't going to learn much here but for the upcoming turner this may be an interesting topic. I'm going to be grinding it by hand out to a piece of high speed steel and I'm going to start by showing you the tool geometry. In my next video machining pistons and rods part 2 I will be machining this component and to put these corner radii on I'm going to need a round nose tool. It's going to look like this and this is what I'll be grinding in today's video. It's going to come out of a piece of 3 8 high speed steel. Now the starting plank will obviously be a rectangle and I'll be grinding all this out. The first thing to do will be to just block the side out and you'll see in this video I don't do it particularly efficiently I have to have two goes at it I didn't quite grind enough off when I started but I will say this when you come to block a tool out like this it's very easy to say well uh, that's the radius that's the radius so I'll start by grinding this to the diameter but invariably you find when you start blending the profile you end up undersized so I always leave the starting blank quite a bit wider than I'm hoping to end up with but I'll show you the details of this now. Always check your wheel for gouges or cracks before starting and also check that the gap between the rest and the wheel does not exceed 3mm. Now you'll notice in this video that I frequently have to tip the tool up to generate the rake angle and that's not unsafe provided that the tool never reaches a position where it can get wedged between the rotating wheel and the rest. So that has uh, got the worst of it out. All the forces there were going radially into the wheel uh, and um, at the moment not worrying about any side rake. This is just um, ground straight vertically. Um, you'll notice I'm quenching in water. Now when I quench in water I try not to get too much liquid all over the place. As you know liquid transfers heat much more effectively than solids do. And particularly if quenching in oil I find if you get the whole thing covered the liquid boils and uh, it starts to burn your fingers much quicker than if you can keep it reasonably dry. Now I'm going to start producing the radius and uh, again I'll be doing this vertically with no rake angles just yet. So with a couple of little uh, rads roughed out, I can see that at this stage the tool is far too wide for my liking. It's measuring about a quarter of an inch and I want it about 200 thou. So I'm going to take a bit more off this side face before I go any further with these radii. Well that's down to about 200 thou now which is uh, much more like it. Um, again I was loading the wheel radially and you can see which bit of the wheel you're loading by where the sparks are being carried round. If I do a bit on the other end, watch the wheel for where the sparks are being carried round. 
see as I move up and down the wheel, the sparks move with it. That shows you the exact point on the wheel at which the contact is actually being made. Back to forming this inner radius. Now, currently all the grinding has been done at 90 degrees roughly and uh, I'm now going to put the rate angles on. To do this I take a permanent marker and I colour it in and uh, what I'm going to do now is grind the rake angles until I can just see a tiny little black witness left and that tells me I've put the rake angles on without disturbing the final profile. Once I've done that I'll then move over to the fine grit wheel finish the profile and finish the rake angles in one. In case you can't see what I'm doing here, I am starting to grind the side relief in to allow this edge of the tool to cut and I'm doing that by rolling the tool forward slightly, tipping it slightly to give me a rake angle in both planes and then feeding it across the wheel and this finger is applying the force radially. On the finer grit finishing wheel now, I'm just going to keep blending this whole profile at the required rake angle until all that black disappears and I get the finished geometry. Now when I come back to address uh, errors found with the radius gauge, if I just plunge straight in and try and grind it, you invariably end up with all kinds of different rake angles. So what I like to do is in the spot I'm working on, tip the tool slightly towards me, feed in until it just clips the wheel and then bring the tool up to the wheel. That way you match the tool's rake angle with the wheel angle and you um, produce less of a, a uh, noticeable dig in. Not sure if you caught that, but I'll do it again in slow motion. I'm bringing the bottom of the tool into the wheel, and as soon as it clicks, I'm tipping the tool up and then addressing the spot. I'm now reasonably satisfied with the uh, tool geometry, and I'm going to put the top brake in. That's fully cleaned up now and I'm going to finish this with a hand stone. Now the jaws on this vise are flat so they won't do anything any harm. I'm going to use a little stone and uh, plenty of oil and just give the uh, profile a tickle up. So I'm using a rolling motion to prevent flat spots and I'm honing this to try and improve the radius rather than improve the sharpness. Um, I quite often just use a tool as ground because when you hone it, if you're not careful, you can actually destroy the geometry of the cutting edge quite easily.
when stoning the top brake like that I just apply pressure with one finger and that aligns the stone for you and then you can maintain the same angle well that's about it I'm not going to go much further with that if you were to be really picky there's little things I can uh, pick up on but um, for a round nose tool done by hand that's um, fine now I keep talking about rake angles but what is a rake angle? To put this simply, have a look at the cutting edge around the top of this tool and consider how it interacts with my square. Wherever I hold it against the square there is clearance around the sides and this is what allows the tool to cut. Equally, if we have a look at the top rate you can see the surface also slopes backwards. Now this sloping backwards of the tool is known as positive rake. You do get negative rake and you'll typically find it on carbide insert tooling where the uh, cutting edge is actually sloping upwards. That's negative rake and uh, a topic for another day. But for simple form tool grinding or traditional high speed steel tool grinding you'll see positive rake. So you'll see the cutting edge and everything sloping backwards. If you're ever having trouble with tools not cutting that would be my first port of call. Consider the cutting edge and consider is it sloping backwards everywhere. An example of where you might see negative rake on a high speed steel tool in a model engineering workshop is for the use of materials like brass. It can be a bit grabby and uh, some people advocate the use of a negative rake to get around that. Now I will say here that my front rake is a bit excessive. The more rake you put on, the weaker you make the cutting edge and uh, if you want to know exactly how much rake you should have, there are manuals and textbooks that tell you, but by and large the tougher of the material, the shallower the rake angle. So for a really tough material like stainless steel you will be coming closer to vertical than say for plastic where it might be raked right back. Lastly I will say that you'll notice there's quite shallow top rake on here compared to the sides. As you put top rake on and effectively tip a surface you actually affect the geometry that you are presenting to the lathe and I'll leave it at that for today that's quite a complicated topic but uh, that's just to explain why the top rake is reasonably shallow but if you're new to all this all you need to remember is have a cutting edge and have all the surfaces sloping back from it now I'm projecting this on the shadow graph not so much to show the errors in my hand grinding but more to show how this tool is going to operate with the side body of the tool set square you'll notice that from the start point and end point of the radius there's actually clearance coming inboard of the vertical on both sides. What that allows the tool to do is feed in, feed across and feed out leaving vertical sides as it goes. And uh, to orientate the tool on the machine so that it can do that all I have to do is get this square to the uh, spindle and I'm well away. I take the same approach with grooving tools that are too small to set by means of the end face. Uh, this is about 15 thou wide and I've ground this again on the offhand grinder such that when I position the body square it leaves me a slight bit of clearance on either side of the cutting edge. So hopefully you survived that little explanation and I will say there are lots of ways to do what I've shown today but however you choose to do them Grinding your own lathe tools is a great way to develop an understanding for cutting tool geometries mostly because when you start out at it the tools don't work and you have to work out what's going on and correct them. Now when I was 13 grinding round nose tools was the bane of my life and I used to end up taking them into school and getting Mr Ashwell to grind them for me but hopefully you've seen from today's video that like everything else it's a series of steps and as long as you end up with the right geometry and some rake angles it should work. Now until next time, thank you for watching and see you on the next video.